Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you this book about Peru. So let's just dive right in. If I can. There we go. So, the inside of these books will be show you where the country's located in the world. Peru. From desert to jungle. See the words too, I guess. High in the Andes of Peru, the mountains are so tall and forbidding that the ancient Inca people used to worship them as gods. Less than 100 miles to the west, sea fogs cling to the Pacific coast. Especially in winter, they cover the capital of Lima and the coastal plain with mist so thick that people cannot see the sun clearly for months at a time. Along much of the coastal plain, desert stretch right to the edge of the ocean. It is hard to tell where the beach ends and the desert begins. On the eastern side of the Andes lies a vast jungle, part of the Amazon rainforest. The forest is home to birds and animals that do not live anywhere else on Earth. Native Indians live among the trees and have little contact with modern ways of living. The coast. Peru's west coast, bordering the Pacific Ocean, is a narrow strip of desert about 1,555 miles long. Oh, look at that sand dune. Thousands of years ago, ancient people settled in the valleys of the rivers that flow from the Andes to the ocean. Oh, human bones, sorry. The small areas of fertile land along the river supported cultures such as the Chimu and Nazca. The desert makes up only 10% of Peru's area, but it is home to more than half of all Peruvians. In the 1980s and 1990s, many people moved here to cities such as Lima, the capital, and Trujillo to find work. The coastal strip is mainly dry and dusty, and gets cool and damp in the winter. Faults in the Earth's crust run along the coast. When the huge plates on either side of the faults slip, they cause earthquakes, which strike Peru several times in each decade. The south coast is drier than the north. The dryness has helped preserve the mysterious Nazca Lines, giant sand markings that cover an area of nearly 200 square miles. The 70 shapes include animals and plants, as well as long straight lines, triangles, other geometric shapes. Each figure is made from one continuous line. The drawings are so big that it is impossible to make out the shapes from the ground. Many were first seen when an airplane flew over the desert in 1920. Archaeologists still wonder who drew the lines and why, and how the drawings were so accurately done. The mountains. The Andes run from north to south. The mountains are so high that on a clear day they can be seen by people 50 miles away on the beaches of the Pacific. The Inca city of Machu Picchu lay hidden in the mountains for over 300 years. Other ancient sites may yet be discovered. The highest peak, Mount Huascaran, is 22,205 feet. It is still worshipped by some Indian peoples. As well as high mountains, the Andes also contain two of the world's deepest canyons. In southern Peru, close to the city of Arequipa, is the Canyon de Colca. It is twice as deep as the Grand Canyon in Arizona. North of Arequipa, the recently explored Canyon de Cotahuasi is even deeper. Even today, it is difficult to cross the Andes from east to west because there are few paved roads or railroads over the mountains. Flying is the easiest way to get from one side of the country to the other, but it is too expensive for most Peruvians. Sheepies. Mountain life. People who visit the mountains often suffer from altitude sickness. The air is so thin that they find it hard to breathe enough oxygen. They get tired and breathless. Over centuries, the highlanders who live on the slopes east of the Andes have gotten used to the conditions. They chew coca leaves to combat the effects of altitude. The Indians raise alpacas and llamas for meat and wool and grow potatoes and barley for food. They farm just as their Inca ancestors did centuries ago. They cut flat terraces into the slopes like giant steps where they can grow crops. 
in southern Peru, Quechua and Aymara-speaking Indians live on the Altiplano, a high flat plateau between ranges of the Andes. The region has been home to people for thousands of years. The Inca believed that humans were first created at Lake Titicaca, the world's highest navigable lake, which lies 12,497 feet above sea level. Selva, high and low. When people think of Peru, they usually think of mountains, but more than half of Peru, 60%, is covered by selva, dense wet forests. So-called high selva grows in mountains, while low selva grows in valleys and basins. The low selva is part of the world's largest rainforest, the Amazon, which also covers nearly half of Brazil. The rainforests contain more varieties of animal and plant life than any other habitat. Some species have not been recorded or named. Scientists think that there may still be Indian groups deep in the selva who have never met an outsider. This is a picture of Iquitos, by the way. It talks about it down here, I think. Anyway. Deep in the rainforest in northeast Peru, yep, the city of Iquitos stands on the Amazon, the world's longest river. It is only connected to the capital, Lima, by air. The city was built in the 19th century during a rubber boom. Today, it is the fifth largest city in Peru and a center for oil exploration. Companies are building roads and pipelines to get the oil out. Biologists call the forests of the lower slopes of the Andes cloud forests because they lie at altitudes where damp mist often cloaks the slopes, giving many plants their moisture. A diverse natural world. Look at these guys going for a ride. For the ancient Moche, Lamas were so precious that people sacrificed them to please the gods. For centuries, the Lama has carried heavy loads and provided meat, milk, and thick wool for people in Peru's highlands. Today, they still carry goods in areas with few roads. The rich natural world has supported Peruvians for centuries. Peru has a wider variety of animals and plants than most other countries because it is home to more than three quarters of the world's different biomes or habitats. Many species are unique, particularly in the Amazon rainforest. Unlike people in other countries, Peruvians have not made a great impact on natural life. In the high mountains and the deep jungle, humans have barely disturbed the natural world. It's a cool map. Oh, this otter. <laughs> Cute. Oh, and penguins. Desert and ocean. It almost never rains on Peru's long coast, and plants are rare in the coastal deserts. The main sources of moisture are the sea fogs that form in some regions where they support shrubs on raised hillocks called lomas. In the north of Peru, little grows on the giant sand dunes. Beyond the desert, however, grows Bosque Seco, dry forest, which is home to a mesquite shrub called algaroba. As the coast becomes less dry in the far north, there are mangrove swamps. The seas off Peru are rich in life. The Peru current that runs north along the coast draws cold water from the deep ocean to the surface. This water is rich in nutrients that support small life forms, which in turn are food for huge numbers of fish such as anchovies and sardines. Almost a fifth of the world's food fish are caught around Peru. Around the Peru current. Sorry. The fish attract large numbers of seabirds and marine animals. In the late 19th century, there were so many birds that guano, or bird droppings, made Peru very rich. The Sierra. In the mountains, plants that have adapted to high altitude grow up to an elevation of about 16,000 feet. Above such heights, snow and ice lie throughout the year, and only lichens and mosses can survive. The puna grasses that grow above about 13,000 feet provide grazing for llamas and alpacas and their wild relatives, the vicuña and guanaco. The most famous plant of the puna is the puya raimondi, which makes, takes up to 100 years to bloom. Before it dies, it puts on a spectacular show. It grows a giant spike up to 27 feet tall with 20,000 blooms. On the slopes of the highlands, Indian communities grow the vegetables that form the main part of their diet, potatoes, quinoa, and corn. The 
tropical forests. Nearly two-thirds of Peru is covered by tropical rainforest or cloud forest. One patch of selva, measuring just 250 acres, is home to more than 6,000 kinds of plants. Such variety makes the Peruvian jungle important for our understanding of life on Earth. Sorry if you can hear the noise outside. I live in a city. The tropical rainforest is swampy with slow-moving rivers. In the north of Peru is the Amazon rainforest. On the Amazon River, which is over a mile across in places, visitors pass through deep jungle. They will probably see monkeys, alligator-like caimans, hundreds of types of birds, lots of butterflies. Peru has 20% of the world's butterfly species. And also the world's largest rodent, the capybara. The capybara looks like a large guinea pig and grows to the size of a hog, weighing as much as 100 pounds. It lives in the water, and its meat is very popular with Amazonian peoples. Empires and ruins. This is in Cusco, the big stone walls. When Spanish troops entered the Inca capital of Cusco in 1532, they could not believe their eyes. The city glittered with gold. Its buildings were magnificent, and its roads better made than any in Europe. It was ten times bigger than the most important city in Spain at the time, Madrid. The Inca were just one of the early civilizations that built empires in Peru's difficult terrain. None had a written language, and archaeologists are still learning about them from the ruins and objects they left. Many of the Quechua-speaking peasants of Andean Peru are Inca descendants. Other Peruvians are of European descent. Their ancestors were the Spanish conquerors, who were another great influence on modern Peru. First Civilizations One of the first great civilizations to emerge in Peru was the Chavin, who built an empire between about 1000 and 200 BCE that stretched through the north and central highlands along the coast. The Chavin worshipped nature spirits and buried their dead with feathers and a shiny black stone named obsidian. Such objects came from the rainforests to the east, showing that the Chavin traded beyond the Andes. Of the civilizations that followed, two of the most important were the Moche and the Nazca. The Nazca were based in the south, where they created the mysterious lines in the desert. To the north, the Moche were an urban civilization who had much in common with the later Inca early empires. In the highlands around Lake Titicaca, the Tiwanaku emerged at about 500 CE to conquer a large empire. Like the Wari, who built their own empire about a century later, the Tiwanaku grew quinoa and built stone cities. Both empires set examples for the Inca. They used warfare to conquer their neighbors and built stone-paved tracks between their cities. The Wari kept records using knots and colored strings called kipu. The Inca did the same. Rivals On the coast of Peru, the Chimu ruled an empire between 1000 and 1470 from the royal city of Chan Chan, which was home to as many as 100,000 people. The Chimu grew rich from trade and tribute. Tribute was a way of taxing conquered people, who had to give crops or treasure to the Chimu. Meanwhile, a small group named the Inca began to take power around the highland city of Cusco almost unknown before 1430. Within about 50 years, the Inca had taken control of the territory of many of their neighbors, including the Chimu. They absorbed many Chimu practices into their own society. A mighty empire. The Inca called their empire Tawantinsuyo, Quechua for the four united regions. At its peak, it stretched from Colombia to Chile and east into Bolivia and Argentina. The Inca forced their defeated enemies to pay taxes, known as mita, through labor and produce. The Inca collected vast amounts of food from those they conquered. Mummy morning, sorry. The Inca built stone roads, which are still used today to connect parts of the empire with Cusco, home of the emperor. Cusco's walls still stand despite several earthquakes. Their huge stones fit together so well that it is impossible to slip a piece of paper between them. The Inca built their empire without either the wheel or a written language. They kept records with Kipu, but were still able to rule a vast area. 
Spanish conquest. After only about 100 years, the Inca Empire fell apart as fast as it had developed. In 1532, Spaniards, led by Francisco Pizarro, landed on the coast. The sight of the Inca Emperor Atahualpa sitting on a golden throne covered in jewelry dazzled Pizarro. The Spaniards seized the Emperor and demanded gold and silver to set him free. The Inca paid the ransom, but Pizarro still killed Atahualpa. Atahualpa's brother, Manco Inca, fled into the mountains of Vilcabamba. Why did the Inca fall? Pizarro had overthrown an empire with fewer than 200 men and 60 horses. Historians have often wondered how the Spaniards defeated the Inca so easily. One explanation may lie in an Inca myth that said that a god would one day appear from the Pacific with pale skin and a beard, just like Pizarro. The Inca may have believed that the god had come, but the most likely explanation is disease. The Inca had no immunity against common European diseases such as smallpox or influenza. Contact with the newcomers meant death for millions of people. From Vilcabamba, Manco Inca resisted the Spanish, but in 1572, the invaders gained control of the whole empire after they killed his successor, Tupac Amaru. Colonial Rule Spain ruled Peru for almost 300 years. Spanish immigrants became Peru's elite. As Spaniards and local people married, their children became known as mestizos. Lima became capital of the Viceroyalty of Peru, which covered much of South America. The city grew rich because all goods sent to or from Spain had to pass through it. The Spanish forced local people to work, often in hot, filthy gold and silver mines. The city of Potosí, now in Bolivia, became the richest town in the world. Its silver mines kept Spain rich. Independence By 1780, the Viceroyalty of Peru was in decline. A sign of growing unrest came with the Tupa Amaru II rebellion. The revolutions in America and France encouraged Peruvians to start hoping for independence. Two soldiers eventually drove Spanish troops from Peru. Neither of them was Peruvian. Simón Bolívar, a Venezuelan, and the Argentine José de San Martín attacked Lima from the sea. Peru declared its independence on July 28, 1821 new country. Between 1826 and 1895, Peru had 35 presidents, including Simón Bolívar. Many had fought for independence. They were called caudillos, or strongmen. Other military men have governed Peru since. Today, many people still prefer to have a strong president. Independence did not change life for most Peruvians. The elite still ran the country, and the Indians had little power. The economy depended on resources such as guano or rubber. There were booms when everyone wanted Peru's exports, but they were followed by busts when the market collapsed, making Peru poor again. After 1879, when it was defeated in the War of the Pacific, Peru lost valuable land to the victor, Chile. The British helped the Peruvians pay their debts, but in return took control of resources such as the railroads. Toward Reform in the 20th century, Peru was split between a rich elite, who mainly lived in Lima, and the poor majority. Politicians found it difficult to make lasting changes to society. In 1924, Victor Raul Haya de la Torre formed the APRA party to stand up for Peru's workers. The government used illegal ways to stop the party from getting power, including killing its leaders. It was only in 1985 that APRA had a president elected. A violent attempt to change Peru came in the late 1980s and 1990s, when terrorists from an organization called Shining Path attacked government targets. The government defeated them and also tackled inflation, or rising prices, and corruption. The changes will help get the economy into better shape and improve life for all Peruvians. Different pasts, shared future. Sleepy time. Walk down any busy street in Lima, and you will see all sorts of faces. Indians, Spaniards, and other Europeans, descendants from African slaves, and later arrivals from countries like China and Japan have, over time, married and created modern Peruvians. In the words of a popular song, El que no tiene dinga, tiene de mandinga. 
A Peruvian who does not have an Inca ancestor will have a Mandinga, or African roots. Whatever their background, Peruvians agree on the importance of family and religion. Generations of a family often live and work together and look after each other in hard times. Many Peruvians are very religious. Most follow the Catholic faith introduced by the Spanish. School is cool. For urban, middle-class Peruvians, life is a lot like life in the United States. Children go to school, and their parents go to work. On weekends, they shop in malls and eat out in restaurants. Life is very different in the mountains, where many families find it hard to earn money. Their kids need to work rather than study. The law says that children must go to school from age 6 to 14, but that does not always happen. In the cities, lessons are taught in Spanish. Children of Indian families who have moved from the mountains to find work speak Quechua or Aymara. They have to learn Spanish before they can understand the lessons. Many of them drop out of school by junior high to earn money to help their families. Children in richer families in Lima attend private schools, which can be very competitive. Students who graduate from high school can choose between private and public universities. Peru had a university even before the United States. San Marcos University opened in Lima in 1551. Catholics and Converts The Spanish made Peruvians convert to the Catholic faith. Today, Catholicism is Peru's official religion and shapes daily life for millions of people. The Protestant branch of Christianity is also becoming more popular. Families go to church on Sundays and celebrate religious holidays during the year. In the mountains, Indian communities mix ancient beliefs with Catholicism to create a unique religion. A varied menu. Peru has some of the most varied food in the world. What Peruvians eat depends on where they live. On the coast where seafood is plentiful, one of the most popular dishes is ceviche, raw seafood mixed with lime juice, hot peppers, and onion. In the mountains where potatoes and corn are staple foods, People cook a special meal called pachamanca that takes all day to prepare. A big hole is dug in the ground and lined with hot stones. Then different sorts of food like meat, beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and humitas, or corn cakes, are put inside and the hole is filled in. The food cooks slowly for many hours, but by the end of the day it is very tasty. Fiesta. Across Peru, it seems as though there is always some kind of festival happening. The most famous fiesta is Carnival, the period before Lent, with processions, music, and drinking and eating. Lent ends with one of the biggest festivals in Peru, Semana Santa, or Holy Week. It seems like all of Peru is on vacation as people visit their families and watch parades of Bible scenes. Another festival celebrates Peru's independence from Spain on July 28, 1821. Music and dance. One of the most important parts of any Peruvian party is music. Some highland instruments are found only in Peru, like the Andean harp or charango, which resembles a ukulele. Other instruments are used more widely, such as panpipes and flutes. Andean people have at least 200 different dances. One of the most popular, the hueno, is danced all over the country. On the coast, a new kind of music from the shanty towns of Lima is named after Peru's favorite corn beer. Chincha music mixes highland music with the music of Afro-Peruvians. These descendants of African slaves still use the same wooden box drums called cajones as their ancestors to beat out a rhythm. Sports crazy. Peru is soccer crazy. On Sunday, groups of boys and men get together to play football in towns across Peru. The small team of Ciancano from Cusco hit the headlines in 2003 when they were the first Peruvian team to win the Copa Sudamericana, beating some of South America's best teams along the way. Other popular sports include surfing. <laughs> Kids in the coastal cities grew up right by the beach, and Peru has some of the world's best surfers. Mountain sports are very popular, too. On the comeback trail. Kind of old news. In 2006, Peruvians re-elected the man who had become the country's youngest president ever in 1985. Few people had thought that Alan Garcia Perez would make such a spectacular comeback, 
but in Peruvian politics, people have come to expect the unexpected. When Garcia was first president, terrorism, inflation, and corruption were crippling the country. Many farmers grew coca, which can be turned into the drug cocaine. But by the time Garcia returned to power, the government had gotten rid of many corrupt officials and defeated Peru's terrorists. Farmers were destroying their coca plantations and planting other crops. As a result, Peru's economy was more stable than it had been for a long time. Serving all the people? Since Peru declared independence in 1821, many governments have found it difficult to work for all Peruvians. The split between rich and the poor is very wide, and what benefits the rich may hurt the poor while what might help the poor would only be paid for by taking money from the rich. Peru's first presidents were drawn from the small elite of landowners and military officers. These caudillos wanted to preserve their own wealth and that of their friends. The poor benefited little from their rule. During the 20th century, two presidents made particular efforts to help Peru's poor. Augusto B. Leguia, who ruled as a dictator between 1919 and 1930, brought in new laws to help workers and Indians. He did not have enough money to pay for reforms, however, and was removed from power by a coup. In 1968, the army general Juan Velasco Alvarado seized power. Everyone expected him to favor the elite like other caudillos, but instead he passed laws to help the poor. He set up rural schools to give Indian children the chance to study. He gave workers more rights. Like Leguia, Velasco found that change was expensive. He did not have the money to see his reforms through. At the end of the 20th century, scandals surrounded the presidency of Alberto Fujimori, a Peruvian of Japanese descent. One of Fujimori's advisors was filmed trying to bribe a political opponent. Fujimori fled the country. Peruvians turned back to Garcia Perez, who had served as president 20 years earlier. Natural wealth. Peru is one of the richest countries in the world in natural resources. Metals such as gold, silver, copper, zinc, lead, and iron are found across the country, and there are vast underground reserves of oil and natural gas. The cold waters off the coast are full of fish, which attract the seabirds whose guano brought Peru so much wealth in the 19th century. The rainforests of the Amazon are a rich source of valuable timber. Despite all these natural advantages, for much of its history, Peru has been a poor nation. A series of booms and demand for its natural resources all ended when the international market no longer needed the product. One crop that is worth a lot of money, but that the government does not want to be grown is coca. Traditionally, Peruvians living in the highlands have grown coca leaves to chew because they help with hunger and altitude sickness but the leaves are also used in the production of the illegal drug cocaine. As the price of the drug rose in the 1980s and 1990s, many Peruvian farmers were persuaded to grow the crop. The informal economy. Jobs in Peru can be hard to find. Many rural Peruvians who move to the cities have little education and find it difficult to get regular jobs. Some people have come up with ways to find other work. In the cities, it is common to see ambulantes. These street sellers are often children. They make money by selling gum or chocolate from trays they carry around. In Lima, unofficial taxis called cumbis compete with buses for passengers. Cumbis are all shapes and sizes, whatever the driver can get hold of. This kind of job is part of the informal sector, the unofficial part of the economy, where people pay no taxes. Experts think this may make up as much as 40% of Peru's economy. It is difficult to know for sure. No one keeps accurate records. Another part of the informal sector is trique. In the highlands, Indians often do not buy goods with money. Instead, they trade them for other goods, for example, swapping potatoes for cooking oil. This old system of bartering used to be common around the world. Agriculture and fishing. With Peru's different altitudes, it is possible to grow almost anything. For centuries, a few landowners have owned nearly all the best farming land. They hire peasants to work for little money. Crops grown on the coastal strip, such as asparagus, broccoli, sugarcane, rice, and cotton, 
are mainly for export. In the Andes, the Indian communities graze their livestock in the Altiplano. They grow crops for their own use and barter any extra with their neighbors. Off the coast are some of the world's richest waters. Fish and fish products are two of Peru's biggest exports, but it is vital to look after stocks. Overfishing halved the catch by 1987. Since then, restrictions on fishing have given fish more chance to breed. The fishing industry has also suffered from the weather phenomenon known as El Nino, which makes the ocean too warm for fish. A promising future. Peruvians are developing better ways to manage all their natural resources, from fish to gold, so that they can preserve supplies and reduce damage to the environment. They are also eager to break the boom and bust cycle by no longer relying so heavily on natural resources to earn foreign income. The huge gap between rich and poor is one of Peru's most serious problems. A more stable economy is the first step in helping the government plan ways to benefit the poorest citizens. One promising development is tourism. In 2000, Peru had more than a million visitors for the first time. People from around the world are eager to see Peru's spectacular scenery and ancient ruins. Numbers are likely to keep rising, as long as visitors do not damage the very site they come to see. Hikers to Machu Picchu, for example, have to take their trash away. There is no more room to bury it at campsites along the trail. It is a hard four-day trek, but the path is always busy. The thrill of experiencing Peru's history is well worth the tired legs. Me someday. I know it. Someday. video relaxing and educational and I hope that you have a very good good good